pretty much the same topic. I'm just basically hopefully going to be filling some of the gaps. And I'm basically going to talk about the weird and wonderful life at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and you're going to love it afterwards. Um, I'm basically going to talk about the my PhD project, and there's a few different aspects, and I hope I have structured the talk. Actually, hold on. No. I'll turn the microphone on. It should be here. Yeah. Is that better? It's microphone. Okay. Oh. Um, no, you're just going to have to shout them. There should be a button here, but it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, I'm going to try. Just keep reminding me. Um, right, so anyway, there, there's quite a lot of different aspects, and I hope the way I structured my talk makes sense. Just feel free to interrupt if it's getting too confusing. But basically, I'm going to first talk, be, I will be talking about the location, and that is something that might be repeated for some of you who were at my last talk. I will talk about the productivity differences at different sites and why that is important. I will be talking about the rich as a dispersive barrier. Most care variations at the different sites at the rich. Then whole theorems. And finally, if I have the time, I'm also going to talk about some other findings. So first of all, that's basically just highlighting the areas where we're studying. So you can see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge up here, and this would be where the UK is. And then the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is sort of divided by the Chalicates fracture zone. And I have to mention to, with that as well, my PhD was part of a bigger consortium called the ECOMA project. So we went always out together with the ship. So quite often I will refer to it as we, because I'm so used to basically working as a group. So none of this would have been possible with any of the other people I've been working with. And basically the the data I got, I got through three different methods. And first of all, I'll be talking about the draws. And draws basically tend to sample an area of the size of hectares, whereas video service, no, ma no matter how much effort you put in, you can't actually see more than a few thousand square meters. And then finally, I'm going to attempt to explain some of my molecular study. And that obviously looks just at tiny, tiny species. So it's basically going from the big picture, trying to understand the smallest, smaller bits as well. The area I, that basically the rich again, um, is quite interesting from an oceanographic point of view. So you've got the Charlie structures on again here in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And we have the um, Scotland Iceland overflow water, which basically sort of hugs the upper part of the ridge at 1,800 to 4,000 meter. And I have to say, all, all our sites were at 2,500 meter depth to sort of eradicate the effect of depth. So it was all roughly the same depth. So that's in deep water. But we also have the surface waters, which is basically running just across the ridge. At, um, the fracture zone, the Gulf Stream, Gulf Stream, and that whole system creates the subpolar front. And what's basically special about that is that, in principle, at the subpolar front, north to that, there's higher surface productivity, and south of that, there's a lot less. And of course, in that sense, the entire deep sea, deep sea taking aside hydrothermal vents, are dependent on whatever happens in the surface water. So all the productivity and everything that's produced comes to the bottom. So that's basically one of the main drivers for any deep sea ecology except hydrothermal events. So I'm first going to talk about all my draw samples. And like I said, this is sort of looking at the big picture. And the questions I was ad addressing were, once do the differences in surface primary productivity reflect the benthos. And with that, I basically just want to explain a bit, because the biomass is basically <coughs> seen as energy. So you would assume that if there's a lot of energy in the surface waters, there will be a lot in the benthos. That's the basic assumption. And the same with density. Biodiversity is a little bit different, because you would expect in either very high or low productivity areas, animals that are specialized enough that outcompete 
other species. So in very high productivity or very low productivity zones, you would expect um, sort of medium to low levels of biodiversity. Whereas in medium productivity, which is obviously very difficult to define, but generally speaking, you would expect high diversity. So that was one aspect. The next aspect I was um, looking at was whether the rich and the fracture zone actually act as a dispersal barrier. And for that, you have to bear in mind, in the water column, every animal lives in its sort of comfort zone. And that's where they thrive at that depth. And then if you look at 200 meters maybe either side, they can't really endlessly migrate up or down. So if they want to migrate from A to B and there's this huge structure in front, they can't just go over it or underneath. So that's what basically the aspect of um, dispersal barrier is in that context. And the trolls we managed to collect were basically all in all four at the southeast and northwest side and three at the northeast side. Unfortunately, we didn't get any samples at the southwest, which was in part due to um, bad weather and also because the topology didn't allow it, because for trawling you need quite flat sediment. And what do you do basically when you get those trawls up? You get something like that. And then you start a very, very tiring process of sorting the animals, which then looks like that. And then you take your various samples for either isotope analysis or genetic analysis, and then you can see here, you sort of accumulate them, take biomass, take them back to the lab and back in the lab, you then take every individual out, measure, weigh and count them. So it's a very long process. And then you look at your results. And in my case, like I said, I expected basically based on the surface production, I expected higher biomass and density at the northern sites. But as it turns out, there was no difference in either of those between the sites, which was quite unexpected. However, there was a significant difference in community composition. So that basically means that although the biomass and density were similar, they were made up by completely different species at the different sites. And just to sort of highlight that, I have found some pictures to sort of reflect the different species at the different sites. So here you see a Holothelian sea cucumber and two asteroids or sea stars, and both of these were only found at the southeast side, and this one was found at all sides, but was a lot more abundant, basically, at the southeast. At the northwest, you found a lot of, not just those, but a lot of um, trigger stars, and you'll probably remember Rachel speaking about them, but they were surprisingly only that abundant at that one side, and also this beautiful, big sea spider. You found lots of them at the northwest side as well. The northeast side, again, was completely different. So when, when you got the trawls back up, the nets looked like this. And these are tiny polytherians. Unfortunately, they got quite damaged through the trawl. So I sort of have to refer to this as a mix of a particular family. But our taxonomist managed to determine five different species, and that's just an example of them. And they are restricted to the deep sea, that particular family. <coughs> so I was basically coming, looking at that. I was trying to figure out what was going on, because clearly the pro surface productivity didn't seem to be driving whatever was going on at the Banthos. So I was consulting with different, um, different work groups of the ECOMA project. And I basically spoke to the Plymouth team that was led by Gavin Gavin Tilston, and he basically, just to confirm, he did confirm over a long period of time that uh, there was definitely a significantly higher surface production in the north. Then I looked at sediment traps. Sediment traps are a very useful tool for deep sea, and that was led by Andy Day from Stams, and they look something like that. And they're literally, they're just a funnel, and they sort of lead in tiny little plastic tubes. And <coughs> that round thing basically rotates, so you can set it to whatever you want. In this case, they were set to collect whatever came from the surface down for every month, so you <coughs> then have also an annual monthly catchment, basically. 
And based on that, you can then get an idea how much of the energy from the surface actually comes further down into the um, water column. And these sediment traps are attached to something called a mooring. And the mooring, that's one of the examples of our ECOMA moorings. And what happens is you normally tend to have two different depths where they are attached, and that is actually very common. And one of them tends to be at 100 meter above the seafloor, and then the other one at 1,000. And the reason for that is that you would expect, at 1,000 meters, you would expect a lot more catchment that than further down, because obviously that's getting eaten up. But in a lot of studies, including this one, surprisingly, there's actually more catchment in the lower troughs. And one theory for that is that it's basically a resuspension that causes that. So you basically, the assumption is that there's strong currents that disturb the sediment, and the sediment comes up, and sort of as a secondary catchment, you then get that into the sediment traps, and that's why there's more. But you can, you can still sort of try and understand how much of the organic carbon, which the actual food for the animals is, is caught, compared to the sediment, and we then make analysis between sediment flux and organic carbon flux. And in this case, at the ECOMO sites, they actually found that the highest organic carbon was at the northwest side. Now, that was expected because that's where the high surface productivity is, but the lowest organic carbon, and this is referring to both um, sediment traps, was at the northeast side. I can't even begin to, to guess why that could be, but it just is. And then, surprisingly as well, was basically at the, set, at the northeast side where there was the lowest organic carbon, there was the highest sediment flux, which suggests that there was actually quite a strong current of sorts that basically disturbed the sediment enough that there was quite a lot of sediment that was actually caught in those traps. And then... I was also I basically trying to understand the differences that could be driving any of the observed biology. And then the um, sediment itself was quite different as well, because it, well, it's slightly different. They were very fine at both or all three sides, but in the north they tended to be just a little bit finer with a little bit more water content compared to the um, south. And then earlier on I showed that current that sort of hugs the upper ridge, which is supposed to be quite cooler and quite rich in oxygen. So again, I assume that there was lower temperatures and higher oxygen at the northern sites, but as it turns out, they're actually the same, or not significantly different anyway. So to summarize this bit is basically why all sites are distinctly different in terms of community composition. They have no differences in oxygen temperature, biomass, or density. So none of that seems to be contributing to that distinctive community composition. However, the highest and lowest organic carbon I've just mentioned basically cause differences in biodiversity. So as I mentioned earlier, the medium organic carbon normally creates the highest diversity, and that actually holds true at these sites as well. And also interesting was that because I measured all the individuals, I could then see that the largest deposit feeders uh, at the northwest side, and these depend on fresh organic carbon. So they most likely have enough food source to grow to larger sizes at this area. Um, in terms of sediment flux, I don't actually know what, and to what extent they influence at the south northwest and southeast side, but I assume that the aggregations of the small holotherians are actually caused by that high sediment flux, because these holotherians are always associated with high energy environments, and they actually thrive, they're sort of the first accessional stage and after a disturbance, and they seem to, well, they are able to reproduce very quickly, and they seem to recolonize that area very quickly. But also interesting was that the largest animals at that site were actually the burrows, which were animals living in the sediment, potentially being able to hide from any disturbance, and all those scavengers. The scavengers is very speculative why they thrive in size at that site. Maybe animals get killed through a high energy episodic event and then the scavengers can eat them. I don't know. That's very speculative. And then finally, the sediment 
what I noticed was that at the southeast side, there was a lot more soft corals, which actually normally corals are associated with hard rock substratum, so they're attached to rocks. But we have actually at the southeast side, we have seen quite a lot of soft corals that sort of anchor themselves into the sediment. And it might be that the slightly coarser sediment at the southeast is basically better to do that, and that's maybe why they, they get quite abundant. It's like a big puzzle, basically, trying to understand it. And then, <coughs> finally, also um, unique species. And this unique species refers particularly to the species unique to that site compared to the other sites. This doesn't refer to endemism at all. But basically, the southeast had the most unique species compared to the northern sites. And I'll mention that in a second again, why that was interesting. So to conclude my initial questions on the trawling, was basically, is the, uh, the surface productivity reflecting, reflected on the bend force? Well, no. Whatever happens that is reflected in the sediment traps, and basically there are so many animals feeding in the water column, whatever happens there is more reflected on the bend force, but the actual surface productivity doesn't seem to be reflected. Then, whether the Mid-Atlantic Church acts as a barrier, um, I don't think so, because there are so few unique species at these sites that it's more likely that the actual environmental conditions, the high food source at the one side and the high disturbance on the other, have more to do with the fact that they are quite different between the sites. However, I do think that the um, Charlie Gitzfaktor zone does act as a barrier to dispersal. And that is basically, in part, because they have so many unique species, and also because the community composition is very different. So, but it's, it's non-conclusive as, as, as yet, basically. And now to sort of zoom a bit in on that with the ROV or imaging analysis. First, I want to basically the, discuss the rich structure, which everyone, or including myself, assumed that the ridge is just a st steep hill, basically. It just goes up a slope, and that's it. When it actually is a lot more complex, and this schematic is courtesy of um, Andy Dale, and it basically shows that it's a lot more complex. So you've got, if you think that's the rich axis, you've got a lot going on. You've got the soft sediment here, which is the area we would have trawled at. You've got really steep cliffs, you've got sort of slight slopes, you've got outcrops, you've got all sorts going on there. And basically what my supervisor Dan Jones and I did, we're looking at the three distinct, what we call habitats. And we distinguish between flat, two to 12 degrees, which I will re be referring to as 10 degrees, and then very steep, <coughs> well, anything larger than 30 degrees slope, which actually turned out to be very steep cliffs. And we did that with our beloved ISIS ROV, which is back up and running and healthy. And we looked at the two different habitats, as I said, the flat and the 10 degree slope. And every transect was 500 meter long, was at a set altitude from, of 2 meter, resulted in every transect being 2, 000, sorry, 1,000 square meter of high definition footage, which is pretty amazing because it's such good, valuable data. And we had four transects per habitat per site, which had eight transects per site, basically. And I then went on and analyzed them. And each video was basically one transect and could take me anything from a day to a week to analyze. So again, quite a lot of work went in there. And just to give you an example, this is basically how the actual, so these are the actual tracks of those transects. So they're randomly distributed and very much thanks to the clever design of my um, supervisor, he, we, we had the bathymetry map in the background, which is the best quality we could get hold of, basically, for that area, and then randomized the transect. So statistically, as well, it's a very sound design. And you might notice that we have the southwest side, which we didn't have for the trolls. So it was really good to fill in some of the gaps we did have after we didn't manage to troll in that area. And one surprise, well, partially surprising finding was that why that there was no differences between the sites, because in the trawls, if you remember, there was quite a significant difference in the diversity. But that's probably partially because in videos, you can't really tell what, spe 
you can't distinguish species. You can down to a certain taxonomic level, but you can't really go down to species. And I'll be speaking in a second about why that is so difficult. So that's probably in part why there's this discrepancy between the data sets. But in terms of community composition, um, again, the northern sites are quite distinct. And the north, northern sites are distinct from the southeast. But interestingly, the southwest side is very similar to the southeast side. And there's certainly very many environmental aspects that are different between the sides. But you also have to bear in mind that in terms of distances, this reflects very much the distance between the sides. The two southern sides are something like 70 kilometers apart. The two northern sides were something like 300 kilometers. And between the south and the north, where you find the most distinct difference, it was 700 kilometers. So there's somewhat of a pattern that relates to distance. And this is basically just to give an idea in nice pictures, not just drawn up ones. And you can see here again the ophiroids, which uh, the protostars I was talking about earlier, they're still at the northwest side. But we also see this um, echinoid and this sponge, which we wouldn't have seen with the trolls. Because the echinoid would break because they're very, very fragile, sh fragile shells. And the sponge, they're sort of rooted into the sediment. And we wouldn't necessarily have gotten this with the trolls. So it gives us a lot more rounded idea. Those opportunistic holotherians I spoke about earlier are these guys. So they're really quite small, but they were still very abundant. And then you can see at the southwest and southeast, there's those species occurred at both sides. The only difference at the southeast side is that we found this sort of spiky um, sea urchin, which is, I think, a new species, which was not as abundant at the other sides. And basically, to then look at the habitat, basically the, between the flat and the 10 degree, to look at whether there was any difference, it unfortunately just adds a level of complexity and confusion. At the northern sites, there was a similar species richness between the habitats, whereas at the southern sites, there was a distinct higher species richness at the slope habitat. And with the community composition, it was similar that there was no difference at the northern, between the northern sites, between the habitats, but there was one at the southern sites. So unfortunately, there's no clear answer to why things are driven or are as different as they are or not different when you expect them to be different. So the question basically is, does slope affected and the answer unfortunately only is possibly and this I think it needs more data statistically speaking it basically says yes there is an effect but it's site dependent which I think I made quite clear but then basically what does that mean from an ecological point and what I think is basically that I mean this is a schematic which is obviously very simplified there's a lot of complexity at the mid-atlantic ridge and you'll get areas like even getting transects, one getting, having one transect very close to this, and then another one up to the summit, will have quite a lot of difference. Anywhere close to cliffs will affect the, um, the water flow, and therefore will have an effect. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the slope itself has an effect, but there's definitely other aspects which I don't understand yet which ones they are. But well, that's the sort of ecological side of things, and that's the trial and the ROV. So now I'm going to try and get a little bit into the molecular bit. And basically on both the trawl and the ROV cruises, I managed to collect a DNA sample, which was, I was quite privileged basically in being able to go out to the same spot three times and get as many samples as I did. And I think by now, you probably have gathered that holotherians are very important, not just for my area, but in general for the deep sea. The, like, the really deep sea, like from the, the trench depths, is considered the kingdom of the holotherians. And even at my fairly shallow depths, they are very important. And one, one of the importance is that they actually bury car um, is their involvement in carbon burial. And because of their they're very diverse, and some of them live inside the sediment, so they have the vertical 
barrier based on them hiding in it. They just turn around the sediment. And then there's others that walk on top of the sediment and through their tiny tube feet to serve the sediment as well and bury some car um, carbon. And also they're very, very pretty. I love them. So you've got, here you've got a rough tail, which basically that one is in the sediment, so if you sort of turn it around, it's not normally, I want to say face, obviously they don't have a face, but mouth down um, in the sediment. And in terms of size, there can be anything from 10 centimeters to 30, 50 centimeters, so that can be quite big in terms of sediment penetration. And then we've got these guys as well there as well, Sort of inside the sediment, while here you can maybe see tiny tube feet sort of disturbing the sediment. And you can see them in trays as well. Um, th this is an example of very obviously different holotheriums, but they're actually incredibly different, difficult to distinguish, especially at the species and even family level. And there are about 50 different characters. Sorry. Sorry, how do you, do you find the how deep? Well, the deepest I have seen is about 50, 60 centimeters, but that isn't to say they're not deep. That's actually it. <laughs> um, right, so, so there's 50 different characteristics, and obviously there are the obvious morphological characteristics, but there's also quite many internal ones, such as respiratory tree and things basically like skin deposits. What skin deposits are are tiny, calcareous deposits that you can't see with, with the eye. You definitely need a microscope. And you take a bit of the skin, dissolve the skin in bleach, and then look at those deposits. And there's many shapes and forms of deposits as they are holothelian. And the problem is they are different in the same species, dependent on whether what side it is, whether it's on the tube feet or tentacles. But actually, most of the species level classification is based on those deposits. And just to give you an idea, so that's from a paper that's um, just about to be published from my taxonomy colleague, Tonya. And so here you can see, this is obviously quite distinct. So this is stuff that's in the skin. And these are called anchors. So they're quite distinct to any of the other ones. And they're quite round. But then, so this is a different family to these guys. These guys are from the same... They are from the same genus. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, so, so here you can see these are crosses, which you can maybe still distinguish, same as those C-shaped rods, but where it gets really tricky is when you look at these, what is called rods, and then something like that. And this is a very true representation of how different or lack of difference they actually is. The only way you can distinguish them is by these tiny little spikes compared to these. Now, if you gave me either one of those, I wouldn't have a clue, which is why I'm very grateful that I work with a very, very well-trained taxonomist. But basically, it just highlights as well that it can be quite subjective. Depending how long you actually have worked with those groups, there will be different opinions. So it's, and taxonomy is, unfortunately, not a clear-cut science. But to go back um, about the identification, as I already mentioned, this is why it's so difficult, basically, to identify them in videos. There's no way of being able to distinguish something that you can only distinguish in the microscope. So quite often all we are left with is to say, right, this belongs to that family. We don't actually know the species, which is why, in terms of diversity, it's very difficult to use species in video images, basically. And then finally, um, because I've been extremely lucky in that unique data set in the sense that I worked with the same taxonomist <coughs> from day one, I've worked at the same samples, the trawl samples and the ROV samples, and the molecular samples. It's all the same people. And quite often what happens, you start something, funding runs out, and someone else catch, picks it up. In this case, we were all working on the same thing right from the start. So what we are trying to do is basically, based on molecular information, to find characteristics that basically can be applied for video analysis. 
and maybe even reduce some of those many characteristics, but reduce it to some that are very meaningful from a from an evolutionary aspect. And that leads me to a little crash course in phylogenetic study, and I really, really hope this makes sense. Um, so, first of all, there are two diff there's DNA. Everyone knows what DNA is. There's two different kinds, sort of very basic. There's nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. Um, nuclear DNA tends to mutate slower than mitochondrial DNA, and mitochondrial DNA is only passed on the maternal line. So that's all, like, from a very basic point of view. So as an example, I've got my little gene. If you imagine this is a gene, and this can be anything up to thousands of base pairs. And this is basically a base pair. A base pair are two amino acids that form a bond. And obviously the DNA is a double, double helix. So that bond forms that DNA. Our entire body, our entire human being, is made out of millions of these four amino acids. That's us. That's it. There's nothing else to it. And um, basically, the way DNA is replicate, replicated is you've got a molecule that sort of reads because they are always together. So A and T is always together, G and Z always together. So you have a molecule that basically reads this and would read off T, A, C, G, T, so exactly the mirror image and then create something else, mirror image, and so on. And the way mutations occur is that there's a misread. So then suddenly, instead of, let's say, reading a T, you read a C. Doesn't, like I said, happens more often in mitochondrial DNA than in nuclear DNA, but it does happen. But looking at Holotheanians, basically, what you do is there's databases which have published all the currently known DNA that exist for holotherian. So what you do is you pick all of them out for the gene you're interested in, and you align them. And when you align them, there are certain regions that are very conserved, where there's no mistake in the replication. And when you look at all the different species, you basically then know, okay, if that region is conserved about around between 50 different species, then most likely in the species I'm looking at, it will be conserved as well. Based on that, you basically design primers, which is effecti effectively that thing that replicates those two bits. And this is basically, you always have a start and an end point, which you need. And what you actually end up analyzing is anything in between. So once you have your, um, your primer, you then take your tissue sample and you mix it up with a recipe that's not unlike a baking recipe. You basically have X amount of certain ingredients, chemicals in this case, which you put into a tiny tube, which leaves you with 20 to 50 microliter of see-through liquid. And basically, all of this is a black box, because you don't actually, you have to trust, you've got the right DNA, you have to trust you have the right primer. So there's no CSI having a fancy piece of equipment that just spits out the data within seconds. This is all taking a very long time. And then you take your tiny little tube and put it into something called a PCR machine. A PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And all this machine does is it creates the right conditions and temperatures for the DNA to be replicated because you start out with very little and you try and get as much as possible so you can actually sequence and you put it up to certain temperatures, which can vary, you set everything, and you put them into different cycles, warm up, cool down, let them sit. And that can take up to 50 cycles. Some of them take four or five hours, some can take days. And then you take your, your reaction, PCR reaction, which is exactly the same tube, looking exactly the same out, and know that there's actually DNA in there. And then you put them into a gel. A gel, this is a example of a okay gel and you basically have a ladder here so you know the size it's but like a ruler and then you take a tiny bit of of this PCR product and you put it into little pockets and then you run a current based on that because of that current and in the water where it sits there's basically depending on the size of the fragment you're looking at it will move and 
the small, the, the bigger fragments <coughs> don't move as far as the smaller ones. So at this point, I would be like, okay, right, this is roughly the right size I was looking for because I did the primer, I know how much the fragment, how big it should be. And you get something like that, which is great for those really light bands because, yeah, I've got something, I can purify it and send it for sequencing. Unfortunately, in places like these, where it didn't work, I have to go right back to the beginning. I've got to play with the PCR, I've got to play with the temperature, with the times. If that doesn't work, I might have to try and create a new primer. So this is all just trial and error, over and over. And then when I send it to sequencing, it basically there are certain places you send it to, they take the bit of DNA I've given them and create those space pairs. And what you get is something like this. And you spend weeks and weeks and weeks <coughs> staring at something like that. This is a tiny fragment. Mine in length is 2,000, over 2,000 base pairs. And each line is a different species. And what you then basically do is you look whether they make sense. Which, you know, it's a matrix or something. But like if you look, I mean, these, like if you looked at this, and you wouldn't see any of these, you'd be like, ooh, not sure, might be something wrong. So you're blasting them. So all you do is you take that same sequence, you put it back into the database, you blast for the most similar species with the most similar DNA. And this is where you start despairing, because 50% of the time you sequence yourself. Mm -hmm. And you have to go right back to the beginning and start all over again. And there are very few, well, not very few, but it does work eventually, so once it has worked and you're happy with your sequences, you then go into modeling and models have different assumptions based on how strong the links are between certain amino acids and how fast the rate of mutation is. And But luckily there's programs you put them in and they tell you what model to use which is best for that particular gene. And then you combine genes if you have different genes, otherwise you just use that one and then you create a tree. And that leads me on to the systematics. Systematics is a term that includes morphological taxonomy as well as molecular taxonomy in principle. And I mean, we are trying to combine it. And just to give you an idea, so it's all based on the linear, <coughs> linear, linear? system. And um, as an example, I put us basically. So we are of the class members, order primates, families from an ED, genus Homo, and we are the species Homo sapiens. And to translate that into <coughs> Hutherians, the class is full of Columbia. We have five different orders. We've got about 23 different families. I don't actually know how many, how many genera, but it will be hundreds. And at the moment, there's 1,400 recognized species. And the, the species I basically managed to um, take samples from from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge create something like that. So that's the tree combining all the genes, and it looks a bit scary, don't worry. Um, so you've got the orders at the sides. So I managed to catch all five orders. You've got the tiny symbols which represent different families, and then the genus genera and the species are quite apparent. But what you basically expect is something like that. This is a really nice part of the tree. Um, so you've got this one order, and it's all nicely grouped together in one, one place, and you've got good support. So basically, in this particular case, I've run my, my sample two million times. So what that one means is, out of two million different possibilities, and, keep, and it kept running and trying to combine most logical combination. And too many times, 100% of the time, it came up with this combination. So that's a really good sign. So that shows that the taxonomic or morphological taxonomy is quite sound for this particular order. And then you go down to family level. Again, this node then goes into a smaller node, which is perfect. Then you've got your genus. And then within that genus, you've got your three different species. So that's great. But then you get something like this. So these are two species that cluster together with one, so 100% of the times, but they belong to two different orders. That's like saying a rodent and a primate are 
evolutionary or genetically like the same species. And if I zoom in on that, I'll basically show you some pictures of those. These two is that Benthosauria, and that one is the diamond. And they don't actually have any similarities other than that they live on top of the sediment. And what that basically shows is that while in some, in some areas we know a lot already about their taxonomy, which reflects evolutionary history, in others we might be picking the wrong um, characteristics to distinguish them. And that's something we're basically, in, co like in collaboration with the taxonomists, trying to find out. And it's very, very preliminary. We are trying at the moment to look at our genetic tree and the um, taxonomic morphology and try to combine and try to find out what might be better to look at. And at the moment, we've got those three. And I'm sure there will be a list of 20, 30, but at least if it's externally, we can be able to identify them at, in videos. But what it also showed was that skin deposits, so this little, very confusing deposits, don't actually seem to reflect their evolutionary history. So this is mainly pretty much my PhD. And I just really briefly, in a very few minutes, show you some other interesting findings which we found through collabor collaborating. And one of them is, you might have heard about Hermione. And Hermione stands for Hotspot Ecosystem Research and Man's Impact on European Seas. And what they do is they try to monitor how the impact of humans is onto the, on the deep sea. And because we had this really good um, video data set, in those 32 square meter surveys, we actually managed to find 0.35 square meter of rubbish. And yeah, bear in mind, this is the middle of the sea. Like, you cannot be any more in the middle of the sea. In areas we have never researched before, and you find something like this. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this. This is a broken glass. And these are just some examples. But we entered, we managed to basically enter those um, into the data set of Hermione, and there's at the moment a big paper written up that we we'll look at the entire sea. So that was a little bit shocking. On a nicer note, we managed to get footage of swimming. And it, it, in that respect, it hadn't been seen how they get off the sediment. And if you look down here, they evacuate the salt. And then basically achieve by doing that, because they just eat sand, they achieve the buoyancy they need to swim. And actively move, active movement they get by holding themselves up, basically, which was really nice to see. And a um, paper that's uh, hopefully coming out soon by my colleague again, basically sort of distinguishes between the different... All of these species swim, but this, this vellum, which is basically the front and the bit, is aiding. And it's basically like looking at different birds and their different wings, and it's just really interesting to see how the different shapes all aid to swim. And when I say swimming, I don't mean fish swimming. They're, they're not going to get any distance, but I can sort of swim or float from one food patch to another, which really helps them as well. And finally, I have some new species. And this is a very charismatic acorn worm, and all three are actually new. This one we only saw about two times, but managed to catch one of them. And then these two. And then some found three new holothelians. And I say we, basically my taxonomy <coughs> colleague, she did all the work, and I just I'm just happy. Um, and so the, these basically, those two have been named after my supervisors, two of my supervisors. Alan Hughes, who will be at Elitinion Alani, and Dave Billet, who some of you might have seen in one of our recent talks, has a, new, has a species named after him, like Mavone Belletti. Um, finally, I would like to go to some acknowledgements. First, my supervisors, especially Dan and Andy, because they have actually taken up my supervision at the end of my project. David Shea, who took most of the images. My Russian, like there was a big group of Russian um, taxonomists I was working with, but I'm so grateful to Ant Antonina because she was unbelievably patient in teaching me about taxonomy. All Ecomer members, we went out offshore three times and you really do become close. James Cockrell, 
the ROV team, which was despairing at the end with the um, videos because they didn't find them exciting for some reason. And then finally, um, Joe Stewart, Sam Duffy and Harry Roch for putting up with my tears, runs, tantrums and mental breakdowns. And I'm actually not joking throughout my PhD. <laughs> Any questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Claudia, for that really interesting talk. Has anyone got any questions at all for Claudia? Yes. You mentioned a bit about uh, spatial variation. Yes. Were you able to look at temporal variation? And if so, um, did you detect any seasonality? Um, I did manage to look a little bit at temporal variation, but not at a seasonal point, because we went out in 2007, 9, and 10. There was, looking at all three data sets, and it's very difficult to compare draw with ROV, but you would always expect a lot denser um, count with, the, uh, with video footage. And there were certain aspects like the um, big sea spiders, big one, um, in, in our first draw, they were extremely abundant. And in the ROV, there were hardly any. So there is an indication that there is a shift. Also, there are some study that has been done at Knox at the Porcupine Abyssal Plain site, and there are certain species associated with temporal change, not so much seasonally, but over the years. And there are some at the northwest side as well. You can't see it at all the sites. So there's the northwest side in particular, where there is a hint. I mean, it's very much a guess at, at this point, but I think there is a depth, there is a um, temporal change. Right. Would you relate that to season or not? No. no. I think it's, it's just sort of to show, I think this whole, I mean, obviously they're very dependent on the primary production, but I think there's also a natural fluctuation of populations. And I think that's something we still hardly understand in the deep sea because it's just really difficult to keep going back to the same places and get funding. But I think there's a natural shift which has been seen in the past as well, but I think it's general for the whole of the deep sea. So in terms of general conservation of, of the oceans, mm -hmm. do you need to keep going back to keep measuring changes? Or? Um, I, I mean, I, in an ideal world, it would be great if we could. I don't think it's that feasible. I think in a, from a conservation point of view, what this study shows is actually how how important it is to take the right decisions in picking marine protected areas. Because what that shows is it's not enough to just say, okay, let's protect this part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and we'll cover everything. What that shows is there is even within the same alleged environment, there's so many variations. And I, I just think it shows how little we still understand. Is it known what caused the tiny deep It's, the fracture zones are all along the ridge, basically. Um, I don't really know what exactly forms it. The way it's been explained to me, and don't quote me on this, is basically that because because it, basically the earth is round, you wouldn't be able to, because it goes from pole to pole, it had to be almost broken off to maintain its shape. And how old do you have to be to have a species named after yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Um, well, my one supervisor, David Billet, who has been working on Holotherians for decades, that's the first species named after him, which is, to be honest, quite an oversight. I think people just assumed he had a species. I think, um, I don't know, a friend has just named species after her daughter, so I don't think H has to do with it, you just need to know the right people. <laughs> <laughs> you also um, the problem, well, the, I had some kind of measurements from the um, ROV, but they don't look very reliable. Um, in hindsight, I should have checked every single time that they were calibrated properly. The majority of them look fine. But there are some where the, suddenly the depth is like a thousand meter, and then you look at the edge of the log, and it really wasn't. So that's that's unfortunate. We do have some other current data from the draws. The 
problem is they're all point samples, so I don't really want to extrapolate too much from them. I have a quick question if I can. Um, you said what you saw distributional differences between the trawl and the ROV. Mm-hmm. Were there any species that you didn't see at all in trawls and then suddenly there were lots of them in the ROV, like a, a completely new species that you didn't expect to find at all? Or? Yes. Um, well, especially species that, like sponges, because we had, with the trawling, you can only get, you don't normally get them, basically. And there were actually quite a few sponges that were in the sediment, sort of beautiful glass sponges, which we hadn't seen in the trawls. And, um, like, the acorn worms, they're too fragile, we would have never trawled those ones up. And, yeah, the new species as well, we wouldn't have found them necessarily without 